Good morning. Happy Pentecost Day. A high holy day in the church. Um, the birthday of the church. We should sing happy birthday, but we won't. But Thank you. <laughs> It is the birthday of the church, and it is a high holy day. If you will look at your bulletins, um, I'm going to lift up just a few things, but please read all the stuff that's in there. I know it looks like a mountain of paper falls out when you open, but it's all important. It's all important, but please look. Um, there is a leaflet front and back about ways you can give, always important. Um, to the church, please look over that. And carnations for fathers. Now, Father's Day is two weeks from today. So if you want to put a carnation um, in memory or in honor of a dad, then fill this out. And the cost is $5 for each name. Not each flower, but each name. If you have one flower with 43 names, well, that's going to be costly. So, and let's see. What else? It is also the first Sunday, Communion Sunday. Um, and is there anything else I really need to lift up? Don't forget we have... Um, Vacation Bible School coming up soon, and we want to be sure everybody is ready for that. Um, and what else? Our graduates. Our graduates are being honored at the 11 o'clock service, and we have one of them back there. Yay! Um, and he is so, he is, he is so helpful to us and we will miss you when you're gone. Yes, that's the one. That one. The one Max is pointing to, his brother. Yes, that is, that's the one. Um, and we will miss him when he is not here. Um, but he will be at Furman. Is that correct? Furman University. Hopefully carrying the good Methodist message to that Baptist school. You have a big burden there, but you can do it. Um, okay, what else? Oh, this piano, folks. Oh, wow. ah, yes, say something about the piano. You, would you like to say something about the piano? Well, it's, it's in your bulletin, but I'm so thrilled to be able to play this. This instrument is incredible, folks. Oh, my gosh. This is like what I used to play when I was in college. This is conservatory. So this, this is piano, yes. Quality. Truly. If, if you have not read about it yet, this is the piano that was in Joyce Daniels' home. And she played it every day as long as she was able to. Um, and it has been well taken care of. And now it is for us. And the piano that was in here is now in the... Um, Old Fellowship Hall, Older Sanctuary. It's in Building One. Yes. The uh, next Sunday is a given Sunday for Peace with Justice Sunday. <clears throat> okay, next Sunday, Peace with Justice Sunday. And that does, um, is an offering. And I think there will be a flyer, yeah, to tell you what that is when it comes. Um, Others? If not, then let us pray. Lord, turn our minds and our hearts toward you. And do not let anything distract us from your worship. Amen.
As you are able, would you please stand for the greeting? The Lord be with you. And also we will sing to the Lord as long as we live. God sends forth the Spirit, and all is made new. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. The hymn is number 384. Love divine, all love's excelling. standing as we pray the collect for the day. Almighty God, from whom every gift and grace does come, let the brightness of your spirit warm our cold hearts and light up our dark minds that we might know and follow your way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, Amen. And now the prayer of confession comes in the liturgy for Holy Communion, but we can show one another signs of love <laughs> with the Holy Wave. And then you may be seated. Good morning. Our lesson comes to us from Acts 2, 1 through 21. 
When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this the sound of the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who speak in Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Bran. The time has come for us to share our joys and our concerns with one another so that we might lift them to God in prayer. And what have I done with the book? There it is. As you know, there is this book in the narthex, and these are the things that are written therein for our... First, we have a joy, and there is a rosebud, a pink rosebud on the altar in honor of Jimmy Williams' brand new granddaughter, Anna Christie Deal. So... And we have um, prayers for the shootings in Pennsylvania, in Iowa, and so many places. It's almost afraid to turn on the news for fear there's another. Um, prayers for Debbie McNamee. Um, she has medical issues. And healing prayers for Roger and Charles Loveless and Sue Crager. Are there others that we would like to name aloud? keeping our concerns in our hearts and ready to lay them before God. Let us go to God in prayer.
God of all creation, who calls each one of us by name. We praise you for the joy of gathering with our church family this morning to worship. We do not have the words that we need to give you proper thanks for all that we enjoy here, where we feel the warmth of the sun on our faces and the breezes that ruffle our hair. We can taste the fruits and vegetables that have come straight from the good earth. And Lord, the sweetness of the cantaloupes and blueberries remind us of the love that you have for all of your creation. And the cool grass beneath our feet on a hot summer day is a pure gift of your love. And the magnolia flowers and the beginning of blossoms on the crepe myrtle trees turn our hearts toward you. We thank you for all these blessings. Lord, in your mercy. And as we gather together in this place of safety and peace, we lift to you those whose lives are heavy with burdens of poverty and sickness, fear, loneliness, hunger. We ask for your mercy and care upon all those whom we have named before you this day, whether aloud or in our hearts. May, you feel, may they feel your presence abiding with them through their pain. May your presence lift their spirits and we pray that their burdens might be eased and that they might know that their prayers and ours for them are always heard. Lord, in your mercy. Especially today, we lift the graduates who are embarking on a new stage of their lives. May they always remember that they are yours and may they always know that their church family will always be here for them. Lord, in your mercy. Be with the people of Ukraine who continue to live on in war or in exile with no place to call home. For those of your children who are in want of food in Sudan, Ethiopia, Honduras, in our own land, for those in the path of dust storms in the Middle East and tropical wind and rains in Mexico and Brazil and other places, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our leaders in our world, in our nation, that God might grant them the wisdom to make just decisions that lead to peace and compassion. We especially lift up our church leaders, our Bishop Leonard Fairley, our Superintendent John Strother, for Pastor Kevin and leaders of our congregation. May they listen for and heed your voice as they seek to guide us in your path. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask all of these many blessings in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Now it's time um, for the gospel lesson, which I'm not going to read today. It's in your bulletin, so go home and read the gospel lesson for today. It's a wonderful lesson. But I am going to read instead <clears throat> my own interpretation of the Pentecost scripture, which Bren just read. This is kind of a, a reinterpretation of it, mine. Okay. When the day of Pentecost had come, the people were together in Swansboro United Methodist Church. And suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, a mighty breath from the Spirit of God, and it filled the whole sanctuary where we were gathered. And there appeared to them tongues that looked like fire dividing, resting on each person there, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in languages they did not even know as the Spirit gave them words. 
Now, there were living along the Crystal Coast devout people from everywhere under heaven. And at this sound, they all came rushing toward the Swansboro United Methodist Church. And they were quite confused because they all heard them speaking in their own language and regional dialect. And they were amazed and they wondered, saying, are not all these people who are speaking United Methodist, are they not from the South? How is it that we hear each of them in our own style of language? New Yorkers, Midwesterners, beach dwellers, Appalachian folk, Marines and civilians, whites and blacks and Hispanics, folks from Alabama and Minnesota, residents of the inner city and rural areas and even the suburbs, rich people, poor people, Republicans and Democrats, single mothers, children, marginalized people, people without direction, people who feel unsafe, people who've made mistakes, high school and college graduates, visitors from out of town, Methodists, Baptists, and Presbyterians unchurched folks and those who have fallen away from church. We hear them speaking in our own way, in ways that we can understand. They tell the mighty works of God. And they were all perplexed, saying to one another, what is up with this? But others were sarcastic and said, no doubt they are either drunk or high. <laughs> but Pastor Kevin, standing with Kristen and the choir, lifted up his voice and addressed them, saying, Hey, y'all, from near and far, listen up. We are not high as you think. It's only 8.30 in the morning. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your teenagers will see visions and your senior citizens will dream dreams and even on the people looked down upon by society in those days I will pour out my spirit and they will have deep insights. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord shall come. And the believers told them about Jesus, how he had lived and taught and was crucified and raised up again unto life. And they testified with many other words. Thus endeth the reinterpretation of the reading. But when I was about the age of our high school seniors, okay, I know it was a long time ago, I rode a dinosaur to school, but one of my favorite songs, and some of you in here are old enough to remember it too, was by the fifth dimension, up, up and away, in my beautiful balloon. Does anybody remember that? See, we're of an age. I love that song. Anyway, a few days ago, I was pondering Pentecost because Pastor Kevin was gonna let me preach on Pentecost, which is, to me, a high holy day. And, I was thinking about Pentecost, and if you've ever taken geom geometry or almost any math course, you know that penta refers to five, five, like the Pentagon, or the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. And I was thinking about how Pentecost is exactly 50 days after Passover, therefore, It's exactly 50 days after Easter. Count it on your calendar. It comes out 50. I know because I did it. 
That is the day the church was born in wind and fire. And I thought about the church and how many symbols there are for the Christian church. And we can see them in here. They're, they're a beehive as a symbol of the church, symbolizing our industriousness in spreading the gospel like bees pollinating flowers or a ship sailing across the stormy sea of life with the cross as the mast. And I realized that I was humming that fifth dimension song up, up and away in my beautiful balloon. And I thought, a hot air balloon could be a very appropriate symbol for the Christian church. Now, I'm going to explain why I think that. When we lived in Alamance County, we lived very near to the place uh, where every year there was a balloon festival. And I loved that weekend because from our front yard at Mount Hermon Parsonage, we could see the balloons as they rose gracefully from the ground and drifted among the clouds. Sometimes they would float right over us, right over us. And one exciting Sunday morning, one landed in the churchyard. Now, <clears throat> when they would float over us, you could hear the rush of the hot air pumping that keeps them aloft. And it can be sort of scary if you don't know what it is. It certainly frightened our dog. But it takes a lot of energy to keep one of those balloons flying and that rushing hot air is what does it. Now, the sound of a mighty rushing wind is exactly what the people so long ago on Pentecost heard when they were gathered in Jerusalem as they waited and prayed. And that is what I heard when the balloons floated over, a rush, a mighty rushing wind. And have you ever seen one of those hot air balloons that's not inflated? I have, and it is not much. It is a big rattan basket attached by ropes to a pile of colored nylon. That's what it is. <clears throat> and the, the pretty nylon part, you know, with all the colors, that has to be spread out on the ground. <clears throat> and it takes, and, and the basket is kind of lying over on its side, and it takes about four people anywhere from 15 to minutes to a half an hour to inflate it just enough to get it up off the ground and to make the basket stand up. And a big fan blows hot air up into the balloon part, they call that the envelope, to inflate it. And then a propane burner is fired up to heat the air and make it rise. Doesn't sound real safe to me, but that's how they do it. And when it finally lifts off, the only control the pilot has is to go where the wind takes it. Now, pilots can go a bit higher or a bit lower to catch whichever way the wind is blowing, but they really don't have much control over that thing. And we learn from the Wizard of Oz that that does not always work out well. <clears throat> Usually, though, just the prevailing winds will carry it along, and when they find a convenient spot, they will lower the temperature and the balloon will settle down. But, but what makes a hot air balloon fly is wind and fire. Those two things. And when there's no more fuel, there's no more fire. It can't fly anymore and it settles down to earth. And a truck 
comes and picks it up. Now, before Pentecost, the infant church was kind of like an uninflated balloon. All the parts were there. All the parts were there, but it lacked the wind and the fire to get it up off the ground. But since that day, since that day that Bryn read about in the scripture, when the disciples were waiting in Jerusalem and praying, since that day there has been a Christian church. Always. Sometimes it's been strong, soaring high with the Holy Spirit, and at other times it sagged down upon the earth, but it has never ceased to exist from that moment to this. I think that's pretty amazing. The story is the story of the birthday of the church, and the gospel message took off from that point and was carried by the energy of the wind and the fire of the Spirit starting in Jerusalem and into all Judea and even into Samaria and from there to the ends of the earth and souls were added that day in Jerusalem. 3,000 souls were added because of what they heard and what they saw. And souls are still being added This day, just a couple of weeks ago, three confirmands were added to our number. It's always a joyful occasion when a new church member professes their faith in Christ and is added to the church. But it doesn't happen nearly as often as it ought to. The story is told of a grumpy old theology professor I'm not naming names. Who was noted for his dull, dry lectures. And one day he met one of his students walking across campus. Hello, professor, the student said. And hoping to catch the grumpy old guy off guard, the student added, do you have the Holy Spirit? And quick as a flash came the answer back from the professor. The question is not, do I have the Holy Spirit? The question is, does the Holy Spirit have me? The Holy Spirit had those faithful people in Jerusalem that day. There's no question about that, but the question for all of us gathered here today is, does the Holy Spirit have us? Sometimes I think we're so busy trying to be the church that we forget to take time to think about what that actually means. And then the church becomes like a, an uninflated hot air balloon. Just lying inert. Sometimes I think we need some wind and fire to make us come alive and to lift us up. But too often we don't look to God for what we need in the church. We think we have to do it. We think we have to do it. Preachers are especially bad at that. We follow the latest five-step plan for church growth. We go to church growth seminars or try to pattern after what some other churches are doing that seem to be successful. We look into schemes and programs and fixes for declining attendance and membership. And of course, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But how do we know what's right for us here? How do we know what it is that we need Well, first, I think we have to realize that only God can give the church what it most desperately needs. That ought to be obvious to us, but sometimes it isn't, even to preachers, maybe mostly to preachers. We think that we have to do it. 
And as I said, we try to come up with new and innovative ideas that only if we do something new and different, everything will be okay. But here's the thing, that community of believers in Jerusalem didn't try to take matters into their own hands. They didn't spend their time getting organized and venturing forth with banners waving. Instead, they withdrew to wait and to pray because they understood that the next move was up to God. And God made the next move. It was early morning and they were all together, gathered to, to wait and to pray. And suddenly the sound, like a great wind, rushes across them. The wind was the mighty wind of God, the Holy Spirit showing up just as Jesus had promised. It was the very breath of God flowing over them, surrounding them, stirring them. It was the very same wind. In Hebrew, ruach. In Greek, pneuma. It, it means breath and it means spirit and it means wind. All the same word. It was the same wind, spirit, breath that had swept across those dark waters on the very first day of creation. Once again, the breath of God is creating, bringing something to life, new life, sudden, irresistible, unmerited life, born from the very grace of God. First they heard it like a wind. And then they saw it, tongues like fire, descended upon them and rested on each one. Hadn't John the Baptist said it? Had he not said that this Christ, the one who is coming after me, who is greater than me, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, wind, and with fire? Yeah, he said that. And at once they begin to speak and they proclaimed the mighty works of God and they spoke all of them in languages they didn't know they knew. The very first gift of the Spirit is speech, language, proclamation, telling. The gift of the Spirit is not a silent interior thing. It's no inner mystical experience to be enjoyed by the recipient only. No, no, the gift of the Spirit is an outpouring of God's own energy that touches every life present. And it is a gift to be shared, passed on. And yes, it came after a time of quiet and prayer. But when it came, it was loud, it was noisy, it was bright, and it propelled the disciples, the church, beyond themselves and their communities and out into an unbelieving world. And we are told that that very day, 3,000 people were added. Now... <clears throat> we have to remember that Christian proclamation is not always well received by those outside our doors. Not everyone in Jerusalem that day <clears throat> responded positively to the wind and the fire of new life. They mocked. They said that the gathered disciples must surely have been drinking too much wine, even though, as Peter pointed out, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. The very exuberance, the extravagance of the Spirit calls those observers to conclude this cannot possibly be what it looks like. This can't be. 
but it was. It was exactly what it looked like. God's spirit unleashed on an unsuspecting world. New life, sudden, unmerited, irresistible, new life. And with it, the church was up, up, and away. Where will the breath of God take us next? Where will the Spirit of God take Swansboro United Methodist Church? We'll take each one here. We don't know. We don't know. We only know that we trust in God's Spirit and we're ready to ride that holy wind into the future. And on Pentecost, our new adventure begins. That's all. Um, now, and, and you'll see that the order of worship is a little different today, and that's because we have communion, so we're kind of, and I had a long sermon, sorry. Um, but now, as a response to the word, And to our love of God, let us continue to worship by offering our tithes and our gifts.
accept these gifts of our hearts and our hands. They are tokens of our love for you. Use them for the furtherance of your kingdom on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. If you will turn to page 12, and you may be seated for the first part of this. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And we have already done the peace and we have already done the offering. So at this time, if you are able... To stand for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. All creation groans in labor pains awaiting redemption. We wait in joyful hope with all your creatures. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He is the living hope in, him, in whom we have put our trust. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As the disciples gathered to remember him, the Holy Spirit came upon them with tongues like fire to ignite them with power and faith. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. 
By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, hmm. Oh, there it is. I didn't see the holy hand sanitizer. Because we are one body, even though we are many, we all partake of the one loaf. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Would those who are helping serve come forward? And we also have anointing. Um, And those who are um, anointing, the anointing station will be where? Over there, both sides. We only have one oil. Is there another oil? No, just a two. No, but I was, oh, it was behind there. I didn't see it. body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. And the body of Christ. of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. anointing stations will be on either side if you wish to be anointed. Okay. Now before we do this, I want to say that in the United Methodist Church, everybody is welcome. Regardless of whether you've been baptized, regardless of whether you're a United Methodist or not, because it's not our table, it is the Lord's table and he welcomes everyone. 
And in the United Methodist Church, we don't take Holy Communion. We receive it. We receive it. It is a gift. So when you come forward, as the ushers direct you, there will be two lines come up the center and back down. But make a cross with your hands to receive the bread. And then take the bread and dip it gently into the cup. Now, if your bread drops into the cup, don't fish it out. (laughs) Just leave it and we'll give you another piece of bread. And if you come and you see a floater in your cup, it's okay. It's just bread. Okay? Are we ready for the Lord's Supper? Okay.
Let us now pray together the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The closing hymn is number 539, Spirit of the Living God.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain among you from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Touch it, feel it, it's great piano, it's got... Oh, the wood.